Um, they've already told you what Savi and the Memory Keeper is about. So I'll read a little bit from the part where um, Savi walks into her new school. The first worst thing was walking into a room with everyone staring at me. My legs felt like a gloopy, lumpy, cold custard. It was a scene that ranked up there with every nightmare. Every head in the classroom swiveled towards me, like sunflowers towards the sun. Whoa, calm down, classroom. Even the desks were shaped like triangles, like wedges of cream cheese, and on every plane sat a student. Okay, then we are triangle school. Bring it on. My heart sank, because here was the second worst bit. The very cool and hip people I had seen in the triangular lobby were in my class, just by luck. They sat on a row at the very back of the classroom, except for handkerchief boy. Ah, new girl, come on in. I'd been concentrating so much on the triangle and the very cool and hip people that I missed the teacher completely. So the teacher's name is Mr. Marook, and um, she's just about to introduce herself when he calls out her name. So, Savitri Kumar, yes? The class erupted into giggles, a noise that rose and rose until I wanted to stomp on everyone to shut up. Actually, I prefer Savi. It says Savitri right here, rule number 21. For the 1768th time, I wondered why dad had named me Savitri. I know, but really I prefer Savi. From the corner of my eye, I saw Dewey boy smirk. Okay, Savi, Maruk sir said. He turned to the class. <laughs> Welcome to another year of cramming, studying, and rote learning. The class roared with laughter. Clearly, Maruk sir was popular. I'm your class teacher and have the privilege of having the other teachers complain about all of you to me. So please keep the complaints to a minimum. Too many and you'll be looking at multiple hours of detention, running circles in the volleyball, volleyball court and writing lines. In the lunch break, Savi meets Tree and I'm just gonna read a little bit where in the, from this chapter called Waking Beauty and it's the tree talking. Finally, a reason to wake up. That was one long slumber. And who could really blame me? The last two decades had been hard on me, on all of us. We no longer felt welcome in our own city, like the people who had been driven, lo long driven out of here. And how could we, when our friends and family were being forgotten, pushed aside, and killed? We, the giving trees, had given so much to the city. It was our magic that controlled the climate of Shajarpur, that gave it its clear blue skies, the perfect amount of rain and sun and wind, clear water and bountiful produce. And I, I was the heartwood of the magic. But then it had all changed. My very heartwood first sank when the people tree fell. My tree rings grew closer and closer as if gathering together for support. My roots dug deeper and deeper, reaching out to the others, telling them, hold on. But the people's bark, thickened by the passage of time, was sliced like ribbons by the sharp edge of a parsaw. Gone, a puff of carbon, no match for steel. The Amaltas fell next, as did the neem tree and the gulmohar, though to be fair, they do fall a lot. The mangroves, they of half land, half water, were the last straw as they began to be reclaimed into our land and concrete. What a strange word humans use for this reclamation when they were claiming something that wasn't theirs to take, that which belonged to the mudskippers, the corals, the crabs, the lapwing. They reclaimed it as theirs anyway. Meanwhile, in the void left by the fallen trees grew a forest anew, canopies of glass, roots of cement, barks of steel, and not a forest, forest of concrete. That was absolutely wonderful, ma'am. Thank you so much. Now for the first question, I'd last, like to ask you that you both talked about the close interrelation between nature and progress. What's the biggest misconception people have regarding that and how can we solve that? About nature and? And progress. Um, 
let me turn that question to you. What do you think about it? I believe that nature and progress thin go together, but yeah, they can go together. I think that is really the problem, that everyone looks at nature and progress as what we were discussing, Harry Potter and Voldemort. They're constantly dueling each other. That one has to uh, be sacrificed at the altar of one another. But honestly, I, you tell me, it's been um, raining. It's already, what, mid-September almost, and all of us are sick and tired of rain. Um, and when there's, there's somewhere there's very little rain, there's somewhere that there's too much rain. And what's happening is that we're not realizing that real progress is actually having clean water, fresh air. I mean, who wants to live in a smog full place with 900 AQI, which is becoming a real, increasingly a reality for all of us? Fresh, uh, chemical-free food, to, uh, access for everyone to all of that. So I think that our, our understanding of what progress is perhaps deeply flawed. And we need to realize that progress is impossible without the basics of living, which is all environment. Also, what according to you is the biggest reason for climate change and how can we, as the youth, help combat it? Uh, so I think for me, it's, uh, <laughs> well, it's human greed. I think we've always wanted more and more and more. And um, climate, the climate of planet Earth has always changed. And we know that when we read geography, when we read history, we know that the climate of Earth is always changing. But today, we've actually changed the age from, we have the Jurassic Age, for instance. We, but now we've changed the age that we've made it the Anthropocene age. And it's just how much ever we want, we keep wanting and wanting. It's until we change that, um, until we change what we prioritize. And I think that's what Savi and the Memory Keeper really tries to do. It reminds us that what we should prioritize is the fact that we are part of nature, that we kind of tend to think that, you know, it's us and then there's the environment. Uh, no, we live within the environment. I mean, the atmosphere is all around us and we are in it. And I think as long as we continue to think that, that the priorities are so skewed in terms of um, what we think is right, which is actually very much like you said in the first question, we have a different idea of progress. Um, I think for me, what's inspiring is all of you. Um, and uh, oh, when I wrote my first uh, fiction book, it's called A Cloud Called Bura. And it's literally about young people like you who come together to challenge this big cloud of pollution that comes over on top of Mumbai. When the book came out, um, Fridays for Future was just getting momentum across the world. And in India, children were standing up and saying, we do not want a future that's full of carbon and pollution. And to me, I think that first step of standing up and saying that hey, adults, grown-ups, take responsibility is important. I think it's amazing, like we were just talking, there's a green school over here. There's so, this campus itself is so beautiful and green. So I think children are thinking the right way. But what's important is that adults need to take responsibility because all of you have homework to do. We don't have homework. Our work is actually making sure that you all inherit a cleaner, safer, greener planet. And so... It's on the adults. The children just need to keep reminding them, questioning them, and that's your work. Also, what do you hope people take away from this very insightful session? So, you know, every time I go to classrooms, and I go very often, and I have the privilege of listening to a lot of children and adults talking about what we should do for planet Earth. What I want everyone to do is when you're done with all of these sessions, go out, hug a tree. I'm telling you, they make the best huggers, firstly. They're really made for that. The second is observe. You know, uh, a lot of people think that when you think about nature, you've got to go through the forest, which is great. We drove into your campus, two jackals were sitting there, and we just sat there for 15 minutes, not moving a muscle, looking at the jackals. 
there are um, lap wings that are just bobbing around their peacock. So you basically, what I want you all to do is to just a little bit. Look closer, because if you look on the tree trunk of a tree, you'll see a bark gecko. You look up, and there will be a hornbill. You look down, and there'll be an earthworm tunneling the soil and making it more livable for all of us. So all I'm saying is that we all just need to fall a little bit in love with nature, because I think that's the only way we're going to protect it. And if all, all of you go out and hug a tree, I know it's raining, it'll make your clothes wet, but I can promise you it will be worth it. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now we will entertain one audience question. Uh, good morning, ma'am. So, ma'am, my question is, um, all of us are in some way either more or less concerned about the environment, but was, was there some specific point in your life that motivated you to care so much about the environment to, um, persuade, to persuade other people to, you know, also take care of it? That's a great question. Now, what's your name? Aditi Rajvaidya. All right. Thanks, Aditi. Um, so, I think for me, um, like many things, I'm going to blame my parents because uh, my mother used to actually bring home all sorts of waves. She would bring in injured birds, uh, homeless kittens, and then find homes for them. Um, and, I, for, and this was in Delhi where I, we used to live. And I was just used to Delhi being this expanse of Lodi garden. We would go climb trees. I would watch squirrels scampering around. And then suddenly my family moved to Mumbai, and I was just like, where are my squirrels? Excuse me. Where is the park? I need to go for a picnic, but there weren't any. And the shy, introverted child I was, I turned to the window in, out, uh, by my bedroom. We, uh, we could see a gulmohar tree, and we could see my neighbor's clothesline, basically those two things. So I would keep looking at the gulmohar tree, and there were these pair of rose ring parakeets who would keep coming. And I think that gave me so much. Uh, this, I was in sixth standard, and it gave me so much of um, and now I realize it was happiness and companionship in that sense. So it was books and these parakeets and the tree. And I think it made me feel like this is what I have. And um, I think if I look back, that was the moment where I realized that uh, nature's pretty cool. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today, ma'am. With that, we come to the end of this segment with more to come. Thank, thank you. you so much for those great questions and thank you, everyone. May I now request Deputy Dean Co Curricular Activities, Ma'am Kanak Bali Singh, to present a memento to Ma'am Bidhi. Loki takes card. This story is a wonderful piece of literature that touched our teen hearts. This book is about a tween girl who is dealing with all kinds of issues, including taboos, drama, and mess happening at school and at home. In this mess, the only thing that seems stable in her life is her will to play cricket, but her gender creates a whole new problem. This book talks about how she deals with the issues, family drama, stereotypes, her coming of age, fame, along with the need to fight for her rights to be considered equally skilled as the boys were. Will she su succeed? Loki, an 11-year-old girl, deals with all sorts of problems in her life, but still, finds the time for her passion, cricket. However, God has other plans, as an online petition released by an anonymous blogger makes her an overnight sensation. However, this newfound fame does more harm than good. Her being the daughter of a typical Indian family, dealing with stereotypes and people judging her and talking about her are just a few mishappenings. Her strong personality helps her deal with all these issues with or without the support of others. This story is a tale of rebellion by a young quintessential Indian girl. 
Ma'am Menka Raman is a children's book author and a communications consultant. She is the author of 13 picture books for children including Gappu Can Dance, Toby Rockets from Thamba and Ira Investigates the Invisible. Her book Loki Takes Card won the Valley of Words Award for writing for young adults. Her stories have appeared in anthologies published by Penguin, Speaking Tiger and Scholastic India. She has written a parenting and children's book for some of India's leading newspapers. Welcome, ma'am. I now request ma'am to read an excerpt from her book, Loki Takes Card. So I'm going to start off reading a little bit from chapter two of the book and a um, little bit of background. Loki uh, loves playing cricket and has been playing with her local cricket team called the Temple Street Tankers for a couple of years. And then after she turns 11, she's told that she's no longer welcome on what is essentially an all-boys team. Uh, but Loki finds it hard to keep herself away from the ground where the boys go and practice with their coach. And that's where this chapter starts. To the untrained eye, it may have looked like I was hiding behind the raggedy palm tree at the border of the playground. But I wasn't. Okay, maybe I was. Just a little bit. The national squad was on its way to an epic loss, which meant the third cross street, which had been empty an hour ago, was now back to its usual busy self. Everyone had decided they were better off going out and about, doing what needed to be done, than sit at home and watch India lose. The Temple Street tankers had turned up for practice, and obviously preferred to get humiliated by Coach Amir than watch the squad humiliated. I'd eaten plenty of bananas, had stood the whole time but it hadn't worked, and I'd scratched the two off my list and decided to take a walk instead. You know how some people, when they watch cricket matches, they're like, I'll only wear this green shirt with the hole in the underarm over here, or I won't stand because if I, you know, if I keep standing, then India's going to get out and things like that. So Loki's tried a bunch of things. I decided to take a walk, and most of my walks these days had ended up with me secretly watching the Temple Street Tankers practice. Coach Amir was bowling to the boys who had lined up by the nets. There were about 15 of them waiting for their turn, and I knew each and every one of them. Their names, where they lived, and how much they scored in their last maths exam. Some of their sisters went to my school. Some of them lived on my street. Almost all of them took maths tuition with Appa. There was Bonda Balaji, my cousin and number one idiot. I watched him show off the new cricket bat his grandfather had bought him for his birthday. He was practically sticking it under the other boys' noses, and I could tell they were all trying to ignore him. Most of them used the team kit. Ancient, taped together bats, super gross thigh pads that were yellow and decaying and smelled of sweat, and threadbare leather balls that were more thread than leather. The Temple Street tankers didn't have any money to buy new equipment, and most of the boys who played on the team didn't come from the kind of families that could or wanted to spend money on new gear. But let me tell you, they had no trouble paying for Girija aunties all year, all subject tuitions under one roof classes. Only Balaji regularly got his gear updated. His father, my appa's cousin, had created some app that made translations easy or something like that, and he'd sold it for a ton of money. Balaji's mother, though, she kept telling everyone how they now own three houses, but were going to keep staying in their rented house because they didn't want to show off. Yeah, right. I stood a little straighter when Suraj, the captain of the team, came up to bat. At 14, he was too old to play in the under-13 team, under team, but since he'd failed seven standard twice, they said he was still allowed to play. That's life for you. An overaged seven standard fail can play for the cricket team if he's a boy, but a girl can't play, even if she's 11 and the best right-hand batsman this side of Chidambaram Stadium. Sure. I'm the only one who knows that, but if I don't get a chance to play, how will anyone else ever know it? Boomp. Suraj had lobbed the ball hard, and it landed near my feet. Before I thought about what I was doing, I bent down and picked it up. Oh, stupid move. Hey, look, Lu Suloki's come. What are you doing? Go home, said Balaji. Lu Suloki. If there was one name I hated more than Lokanayaki, it was Lu Suloki a name I had regrettably given myself in UKG when we were learning the alphabet 
And Meeta ma'am had asked each of us to think of a word that described us and started with the same letter as our name. I said Lusaloki and the name had stuck. That idiot Balaji, he wouldn't know a Yorker from a Chinaman. I stepped up from behind the tree and shined the ball against my itchy nylon skirt. Loki, what are you doing here? Coach Amir yelled. Coach, can I bowl just once, Coach? Please, I've been practicing. I could hear the begging in my voice and I hated it. The boys were now all watching and laughing. I could feel my face heat up, but not because I was embarrassed. I'd been laughed at plenty of times before. I was mad. My breath was coming out in short, angry puffs, and I ran up and bowled anyway. The ball hit Balaji in the stomach, and his face froze mid-baboon laugh and changed into an expression of pain. Soon, everyone was laughing at him. It didn't even hunt, hit the stumps, you stupid, Balaji said, wheezing. I wasn't aiming for the stumps, you stupid. And before anyone could say or do anything else or laugh any louder, I turned and ran out of the ground. A little, little bit from later on in the book. So Loki, who's of course been told that she can't play for uh, the team, she has a neighbor in her building called Malati Akka, uh, who many of the other residents of uh, the Eiffel Abhirami live, that's the name of her apartment. They all don't like Malati Akka because she's divorced and they all tell their children to keep away from her because being divorced is contagious, I suppose. But uh, Malati Akka tells Loki, look, if you really want to play for this cricket team, then you need to do something about it. And she puts the idea in her head to start a petition and to get enough signatures to be, you know, to go and show to the management of the team. So Loki uh, makes a petition and uh, in chapter five, she decides to go out and get some signatures for it. And the first place that she lands up is at the um, vegetable cart, which is on Third Cross Street, which is where she lives. And it's manned by a person called Tambi Uncle. And Tambi in Tamar actually means your younger brother. So it's an interesting name he has. I watched Tambi Uncle carefully arrange the pomegranates on his cart. His brow creased in concentration. I couldn't tell if it, because, if it was because he was concentrating on what I was saying or the pomegranate pyramid he was making. I decided to be more forceful. So I jabbed my pen about when I made what I thought were some very important points. But this just made Tambi Uncle put his arms protectively around the fruits, as though they were precious pink babies. Careful, he growled. No one wants to buy bruised fruits. I took a step back without taking a break from my carefully rehearsed speech. It wasn't as easy as delivering it to an actual person as it had been to my reflection in the bathroom mirror at home. I clutched my clipboard with the petition I'd written attached to it and tried to avoid using English words as much as I could but I couldn't help it. What was the Tamar word for discrimination? Gender rights. If my Tamar teacher Ilango sir could hear me, I'd get a whack for sure. After my visit to Malatyaka's house, I couldn't get the idea of a petition out of my mind. The idea that a piece of paper sound, signed by a bunch of people might help me play cricket was a little crazy. But seeing as my way, going and begging coach and being humiliated by the boys wasn't working, I decided it was worth trying. So I had written out what I hoped a petition was supposed to say and headed out to get people to sign it. Equal, you're talking to me about people being equal, Tambi asked. I like you, Papa, but what do you know about being equal? Your own mother, she won't give me a glass of water to drink from your kitchen. I opened my mouth to protest, but then closed it again. I knew he was right. Amma and most of the aunties in my flat had separate glasses and plates for Tambi uncle, the Akkas who cleaned our houses, and Biki Aya who delivered the milk and always had a packet of biscuits on her for Shiva Mani, the three-legged dog of Third Cross Street. Hmm, Tambi uncle continued. You know what I'm talking about. See, they like to tell themselves that they are good people because they give me a glass of water on hot summer afternoons that they give me two-day-old idlis and sour curd that they are about to throw away. But is that really good? A funny look crossed Tambi uncle's face as though he was remembering the taste of the two-day-old idlis and sour curd. Tambi uncle, listen! Oh, I sounded like Amma. Yes, yes, I'm listening. Everyone is equal, good for everyone. What do you want me to do about it now? 
I want you to help me play cricket for the Temple Street Tankers. That Dabba team? Why do you want to play for them? They're terrible. Make your own team. I've seen those boys play. They're useless. You're better off making your own team. They're not useless. Ravi's a good opener. Anand bowls nice length and line. Ishwa's a good pinch hitter. And shh, 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 shh. Okay, okay. I don't want to hear everyone's horoscope now. If you want to play with those idiots, that's your problem. Now tell me, how is this chit of paper going to help? That's what I've been trying to explain for the last 10 minutes. If I get enough signatures on this form from people who agree with me, then the team might let me play. Papa, if signing a piece of paper was all it took to change things, then everyone would be out there, no? Waving sheets of paper around and signing. You rich people have no idea of the way things work in the real world. What's the point of all this education if you're all still so dumb? Though being called dumb hurt, I could see that Thambi uncle had a point. If a petition was all it took to change something that was wrong, why did so many stupid sucky things still happen? What if this was a dumb idea? What did Malati Akka know anyway? How many petitions had she done that it made a difference? My shoulders sagged as I felt the hope that I'd been clinging to slip away. Okay, okay, don't start crying now. I'll sign it. Give, give. I got the feeling that Thambi uncle just wanted to get rid of me, but I didn't mind. I had brought an ink pad along with me so that everyone could sign the petition. I took it out of the small bag slung over my shoulder and held it out for Thambi uncle. He stared at it with disgust. What? You don't think I know how to sign my own name? I studied till 10th standard, okay? I know more than you do. Give me that. And he grabbed the pen from my hand, rested the pad on the side of the cart, and signed his name where I pointed. He admired his signature and then turned the piece of paper over. Wait, am I the first person you've asked? No, I said reluctantly. I've asked 10 people so far. And no one else signed. I'm not surprised. The people on this street, they hate change. Go to Arasa at the tea stall and Rani who sweeps the road. She and her friends will sign and ask Raju who fixes shoes near the temple corner and tell them that Thambi sent you. Thank you, Thambi uncle. Wait, take this. How will you play cricket if you're so skinny? I caught the pomegranate. Thambi uncle tossed at me. Thank God. Imagine signing your chit of paper and finding out that you can't even catch. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now we move on to the question and answer session. How does the character of Loki resonate with you? What would you say is your inspiration to write the book? Ooh, um, I, think, I think I'm really different from Loki. <laughs> and I think when people ask me if Loki is, I get a lot of students ask me, is Loki based on you? And I think, no, Loki is the person I wish I'd been when I was growing up, because I think um, she kind of throws herself into this, whole, uh, into this whole agenda and idea of hers, and she goes after it. And um, she's, she's, not, she's a little concerned about people being upset with her, but not entirely or too much, and she really goes after what she wants. So I think for me that, uh, it, it's, it's really, I wish I'd been this person, and I, I think I still wish I was a bit more like Loki in, in going after what I wanted in life. And, you know, doing the things I wanted to. Um, but I think what resonates uh, with me mostly is um, that she is this person with dreams and, you know, she really wants to do these things with her life. And um, I think that's something that most of us can identify with, having something inside of us that we want to do. So, yeah. Hello. Your book deals with major issues, gender discrimination and gender taboos. How do you think the uh, book relates with the male demographic? Ooh. You know, I was asked some time back, uh, they said, like, why are all the men in Loki's life, like, they're, all, they're not very supportive, and, you know, why are they? Um, you know, I have two boys. They're 14 and 11, and I think that they play as much important a role as um, young girls and women do in fighting for gender equity and equality, because I don't think that it's enough for us to keep telling young girls and telling women that you can, 
you know, do whatever it is that you want to do and you can, you know, go after your dreams and achieve and aspire and all of those things if we aren't having conversations with young men and boys that you also, you know, you're also going to have to play a really important role in this. And that's in terms of being allies, support, friends, calling out gender discrimination when you see it, you know, even if it's happening to someone and, you know, you're a bystander, calling it out and standing up, you play such an important role. Um, so, yeah, maybe while Loki's father is not, uh, you know, he's a, he's a very quiet man <laughs> and he doesn't, you know, he's kind of just trying to quietly get on with his life, I think. I think her brother comes, stands up, you know, at, at some point, he comes up to the plate and he does his bit. So I think really to all, um, to all the men who might read this book, uh, I hope they see that they have just an important role to play in fighting for women's rights as women do. What was your inspiration behind the character of Poetic Party? She had a great impact on the storyline of the novel. Um, you know, I think that, uh, wow, this is a good question. So she's not like, in, she's not based on anyone I know or anything like that. But as I was writing the story, and I knew when I started writing uh, the book that, that there would be some, some degree of like a, a viral, you know, campaign. Because you see that happening so much, right? There's a small news item in the paper or online. And before you know it, that's kind of spiraled into this matter of national importance because, you know, someone decided to follow a hashtag and tweet about it and things like that and th things become trending and viral and all. So I knew that was going to be a part of it, but I think I wasn't sure when I started the book who it was going to be. And uh, it just so happened that as I was, you know, writing the first few chapters of the book, to me, uh, the grandmother seemed like, you know, just a good choice for this, uh, to be this person, to be this kind of secret uh, Twitter personality doing this. And I think it's interesting because the grandmother also throughout the book is a very quiet, you know, person. She's very much in the background. She doesn't talk much. She doesn't openly stand up for her granddaughter or grandson even once throughout the book, right? Uh, she's kind of just this mute spectator to what's happening. Um, so I thought it would be interesting if she actually was a person who did have all these big opinions and big thoughts and big ideas, but she just found her own way of, of sharing it. Um, and I, I mean, I suppose I could have explored why she was like that, that kind of dichotomy in her, but I thought it's okay. I think everyone has their own ways of wanting to talk about the issues that matter. I think grandparents, um, some students were asking me yesterday, like, you know, grandparents, can be so traditional and can be so, um, have very different thoughts and ideas and not always be so supportive. But I think uh, grandparents are products of their time and so they might seem very out of sync with the way, you know, young people today think about things. Um, but I think if you sit down and have a conversation with them, you might be surprised by some of their opinions. And if you're not, and if they still don't see eye to eye with you, I think then as, you know, grandchildren, it's really up to you to drag them into the 21st century. I think that's something you can do. Your book breaks many stereotypes. Do you think an older audience would be opposed to your topics of uh, choice? Because some of them are not, and some of them are very in with the topics. Give me an example of, of... Like, sometimes our grandparents would oppose of the things we think of as moderns, and sometimes they really surprise us by supporting in something that we wouldn't think they would. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, hmm. so, um, so, for example, uh, my mother-in-law, who's 80, and her sister-in-law, who is uh, maybe also 80 plus, they both read the book. And my mother-in-law was completely fine with the part of the book where Loki gets her first period. Like, she has no comment on that at all. Her sister-in-law was very upset. <laughs> she called me and she said, why should you put things like this and all in this book? It's completely unnecessary. And she's quite, you know, she's like, I really don't think you should. She's very offended by it. But when I asked my mother-in-law, she said, no, it happens to all women. I mean, really, I, you should be able to put whatever you like in a book. So I think, you know, everyone brings their own, uh, their own 
baggage, if you will, to the things they read and their own feelings and things around it. Um, it could be that my mother-in-law has a daughter, so she's far more kind of empathetic and in tune and uh, okay talking about these things than her sister-in-law is. So I think everyone brings their own kind of experiences and baggage to things, but I think if anything, you know, reading and having conversations about it is one way. So I then told, you know, this aunt-in-law of mine, I said, what's there? I mean, it's fine. You get your periods, I get my periods, it's no big deal, it's just, you know, biology. That's all that it really is. I don't think I fully convinced her, but I think it was important I was able to tell her how I felt, so yeah. Now, we will take two questions from the audience. Good morning, ma'am. Ma'am, I am Abbas Arif of uh, Colonel's Academy School, Mau. And ma'am, uh, I, uh, I ask you that, uh, what led you to becoming a writer and uh, writing those fantasy fictions? And uh, what are your future plans for writing another book? Oh. Um, you know, I've, I've been writing stories since I was about five or six and um, all sorts of stories, like, you know, for creative writing classes in school and just otherwise, and I used to keep journals and all terrible stories, by the way. When I go back and read them now, I cringe. But I just always, uh, I just always really enjoyed making things up and kind of uh, imagining different scenarios in my head and what would happen to people in them. So I suppose I've been writing since six. Um, but yeah, I think I just always really like, I think my favorite part is putting something out there and having a reader come up and tell me that, oh, you know, this bit in this book, I really love that. There's just, because that's why we write. We write to kind of put a part of ourselves out there and, and hope it resonates with someone else in the world. So I think for me, that's, that's my favorite part when, you know, you and your classmates came up and spoke to me and Bijal today morning uh, and yesterday some students came and getting asked questions. I think that's, that's the best part. So that's really why I keep writing is to have more of these interactions. What am I working on next? I have deadlines which I've been ignoring, but I am writing uh, a picture book for children a little uh, younger than you know, those of you gathered here today, uh, which is going to talk about the scientists, the women scientists in particular, who helped launch India's Mars Orbiter mission. So that's something I'm working on. And I have a draft of a, another middle grade book, uh, which is about high school elections. So that's something that I'm working on. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, I'm from DPS Bhopal. Uh, it was a pleasure to read your book. Uh, my question is that, that why did you choose Thambi uncle as the first person to sign the petition? Like, why him? Thank you. Wow. I mean, I suppose if I, uh, if I look back now and I try and retrofit an answer, like probably at that time I was just, you know, I don't know, I thought, oh, I like the idea of this. You know, like where I grew up in Madras, uh, we have one uncle who comes every day with his cart of, you know, vegetables and fruits and my mom buys from him and plans what we will eat based on what he has, right? And, um, is that mine? Okay. And, um, and I think you, you know, I've grown up seeing our uncle on the street and uh, now I go back to Madras with my dog and he comes and brings carrots and beans to feed him. He's very much a part of our, of our lives and, you know, they... Uh, he knows me and my sister and who are married to and our kids and they're just very much a part of the community. Though I think very often the residents of, you know, streets like Third Cross Street might not, you know, really consider them to be so or even think of them when they think of who is in this community uh, that exists around them. I think I was also trying to make a point that very often, you know, we have certain conceptions or perceptions that, oh, if I go to a school like this and I come from a family like this, 
and I go on holidays to these kind of places, and I'm on social media, it means that I'm a very progressive person. <laughs> or, or we look at people who seem like that and think, well, this must be a broad-minded person because, you know, look at the way they're dressed or the way they talk. And I think sometimes we realize that, you know, progressive ideas um, or thinking or support doesn't always come from those quarters. And I think we really need to, to kind of be aware that you know, where you went to school or how much money you have and things like that aren't indicators of how broad-minded a person can be and how progressive a person, you know, someone is. So that's why really all the signatures that Loki gets in the beginning come from all the community workers of Third Cross Street. And Rani Akka famously tells her, I'll sign your petition and when you become Chief Minister Amma, you should do something for all of us. Because I think they all really believe that Girls can change things, and of course they can. Thank, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I hope you had a lovely time. Absolutely. Like I said, this is the best part of being a writer. Thank you so much uh, to everyone for your questions and for reading Loki. I had a great morning. May I now request Deputy Dean Pastoral Care Day Boarders, Ma'am Shilpa Virmani, to present a memento to Ma'am Menka Raman as a token of our appreciation. and Ojas Sethi to join us for a quick Q&A session. To Devangna, how did you come up with this whole idea of a new mystical world? Um, I think that the pandemic had a huge effect on this because I wrote this book in 2020. So the pandemic created a ripple effect of worry and anxiety for everyone. So I kind of channeled that negativity into a creative side. So I think I picked up a lot of ideas from the actual crisis because like how at that time there was no vaccination. Um, in this fictional world of Red Alchuya, there was a curse with no cure. So I think I got inspired from the crisis. Question is for Urjit. You wrote a book called Jack Belaine. It's about a 15-year-old who's in an orphanage and has this crazy adventure. Who, motivate, who motivated you to write this book? Uh, the main motivator was my mother. So this was written in the lockdown time. So um, whenever, my, whenever I didn't feel like writing the book, my mother just used to say, say like, come to the household work. And I was like, no, no, I'm writing the book. I'm writing the book. So. That, yeah, that was the main motivator. Risha, your story has five characters, namely Tia, Ron, Udit, Karan, Eddie. Their initials together form Truce, the title of your book. Who do you relate the most to? Well, each of my characters has a certain part of me, and I love them all. However, the person I relate most to is a side character called Valerie, who is Udit's love interest. So that's who I relate to. Okay, now this next question is for all of you. Are you writing anything new these days? If yes, then can you tell us a little something about it? Um, okay, yeah, I am working on another book, but it has a slightly different concept. So it's a poetry book that I'm co-writing with this friend of mine, and it focuses on the adversities and negativity that a teenager or a young adult faces at this time, which is often overlooked. So it, its main aim is to make people feel valued and make them feel like they belong. So it focuses on a lot of things like body dysmorphia or envy or anxiety. And it's basically trying to create a safe space for people. Um, I'm also working on another project. Um, it's more of like an Indian high school drama, dealing with friendships, betrayal, and this time I'm, I'm writing it in Hindlish, so that it relates to the masses more. It's, it's in the works right now, yeah. 
Guys, I think over a round of applause. And thank you so much for joining us here today. We are really proud of the fact that you've accomplished so much in your tweenage and teenage. Thank you. Thank you. Please the readers to grab the book and indulge in it. Please know that the event is by no means an attempt to make the students sell books. It's just a fun way to highlight their selling and business skills. No real book sale will be attached to the event. As the first participant, we have Anaya Tiwari from Medicaps International School. Animals have no voice. They can't ask for help. They can't ask for freedom. They can't ask for protection. Humanity must be their voice. With this insightful thought, I, Ananya Tiwari, an avid reader from Medicaps International School in Dort, wish warm greetings to the dignitaries and my dear friends. Moving ahead with Mr. Williams ideology, I would say that humanity must be the voice of animals. But the question is, is humanity actually the voice of these mag magnificent yet beautifully mesmerizing creatures? Today, we are aesthetically delighted with the presence of Ma'am Neha Senha, who has inspired young generation by paying heed and developing a cocoon of understanding about the condition of wildlife in India. From the fierce leopards to the playful monkeys, from the captivating birds to astonishing hiss of cobra, Ma'am Neha Senha has the warm style of writing non-fictional narration. The 11 chapters of the book are carefully drafted, capturing the essence of animal life, filled with observations, irony, and last, leave us all amazed. The book starts with the description of leopards, moving to the beauty of starlings, explaining the state of tiger, cobra, elephant, and the list goes on. God has been kind to gift us breathtaking creatures, which never fail to surprise us. But are we doing justice to them? Humans are deeply impacting the flora and fauna in an erroneous way. The book attains a striking balance between the world of wonder and misery. Wild and willful is a splendid chronicle which must be read to understand the world from a varied perspective. Indeed, it is a must read. So, come, let's enjoy the journey of flora and fauna in a beautiful book, Wild and Willful, by Ma'am Neha Sinha. Thank you so much, everyone, for being a good audience and have a pleasant day. Thank you. Have become desensitized to global issues such as climate change, deforestation, and global warming. The author of the book, Bijal Wachirajni, is precisely aware of this tendency of ours to only look at the juicy headlines and news and ignore the indispensable facts and use her voice, her words, to persuade people to educate themselves and to take action to combat such problems of the modern world. Not only this, she makes the book very relatable to teenagers by drawing a parallel between the loneliness a child experiences during teenage and the loneliness that plants have been experiencing since humankind started thinking about themselves as higher. Another feat achieved by the author, and I say achieved, as the book has been cherished by many, many children, is a display of trauma through multiple perspectives while simultaneously maintaining an appropriate depth of language comfortable to be known or read by tweens. The abruptness of Savitri's nature of not accepting her father's death when she says, how did the world exist without him? Also symbolic in a way to climb it and gives us a lesson that we mustn't too go with the flow of harmful economical development and rather strive for change. Vacharajni's treatment of trauma and angst is masterful, but at no point it is overly dramatic. Intertwining love and loss and how they change the way her characters see the world 
She presents nature as a healing force. The trees and plants and leaves talk to the girl and have a sarcastic humor accompanied with perfect comedic timing, which can be rival of that of us, teenagers. The author evokes, the, the author evokes how nature is, is a fundamental part of childhood nostalgia and joyful memories. We need to realize that this planet needs healing, and it is a potent reminder that the great outdoors, our pleasure of joy, are ever so slowly disappearing. But one might wonder, why should this book concern teenagers? What can we, mere 15 or 16 year olds do, which can change the thought process and functioning of major industries? We can use our voice, just as the, just as the author used hers. The book's ultimate goal, to change the young generation's mindset, is a, is is a tailor-made and flawless approach to the problem. The upcoming future is contingent on us. We'll bring the revolution of change, of good change. This was Aditi Rashwat for Savi and the Memory Keeper. Thank you. Present here today, I, Vishal Kataria from Golden International School, is going to talk about a book, a book which represents a 11-year-old girl uh, who loves to play cricket. Uh, um, but her parents don't even support her and when she had gone to the coach but the coach refused because the coach because he wanted to suck with his rules and she she was determined uh, to play cricket and that's why she didn't lose her hope and tried her best then she filed a petition to gain support uh, the source people the some people were in the opposed for the petition and some were for her in the same. Now, what do you think? Will she ever be able to play cricket? Or will she be able to get the support for, of her parents? Or will she be able to fulfill her dreams? For all such questions, you should read the book. It's not just a book. It's an emotion uh, attached for the people who who still have stereotype mentality uh, and anchorage. Uh, thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. I'm from Mayo College Girls School. I'll be speaking about the book Voices from the Lost Horizon, written by Anvita Abhi. This book is an epitome of literature about ethnography and linguistics. Andamanese culture, Andamanese language and linguistics explored throughout the book which opens up the readers to a very new world. Professor Abhi, a scholar with scientific credentials and expertise in sociocultural capital, has spoken to native Andamanese and adapted native Andamanese stories and songs in the culmination of this book. Voices from the Lost Horizon instills in the readers a cathartic episode as it revives old collective memories, countering the cultural amnesia through our Professor Abhi's art of recollection, reflection, and sharing. Now a junior and Boa senior, act as invisible co-authors of the book and in transporting the readers to long lost world of the great Andamanese. An emotional Boa sir once appealed to Abhi, don't let the language slip away, keep a hold on it to it. Keep a hold on it, onto it. The language could have died with the passing of the last native speaker had Professor Abhi's documentation of it not existed. However, loss of languages and culture are not limited to the great Andamanese. It resonates with indigenous people across the world, especially in this age. In this age of neo-colonialism, languages must outlive their native speakers, and Mam Abi's book, Voices from the Lost Horizon, explores that narrative like no other. I feel as people of the 21st century, not knowing about the lost languages and focusing more on the languages, which in the soon times may not exist, we should focus on not only preserving our environment or the species which may not exist anymore, but focus also on the literature and the languages that we may not get to experience in the future years for the future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Prisha. From BPS Bhopal Nilgar. Now, I have a question for you guys. How many of you think that female in India have given the, are given the right to spread their wings and fly freely. Please raise your hands. Well, if you think so, then this book isn't for you. 
I'm so sorry, no offense. But, but, if you want a reality check, then you should not do the mistake of not buying this book. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let me present to you Minikanaman's fiction, Loki Takes God. How will you feel if you were told to unfollow your passion because of your gender? Of course, you will feel disheartened, sad, angry, and especially discriminated against. This is how an 11-year-old girl, Lok Naiki Shan Mugam, feels when she was told to unfollow her passion of cricket because she's a girl. You're a girl. Play with a Barbie. You are not strong. You cannot cope up with the strength of the boys. These were the things that she heard daily. Well, are we in the 1800s? It's the 21st century, my folks. Minds change, people evolve, and technology has reached to so many heights. But what did not change was the mindset of the people. this book to find out how Lok Naiki became an inspiration for so many people to fight for themselves, especially girls. Read this book to find out how her mother was this close to disowning her and how her father had already given up on her. Read this book to find out the disgressive minds of the egalitarian society. Read this book to find out about the exemplary courage and passion showed by an 11-year-old girl. Now you might be thinking that there are many books written on this topic and many movies made. But why should you read this book? Well, you should read this book to reach an unexpected ending, to find the mysteries and suspense that were written in this book, the emotions that were filled in this book. And this would make you feel so warm-hearted, like it made me when I read this book. We have Ashita Gupta from Chohitram International. And the world at large is that we are a part of it, not owners of it. A very good morning to the dignitaries present here, respected teachers, and my fellow budding authors. I am Ashita Gupta of Chohitram International, and I've read the book Wild and Willful by Neha Sinha. The book reveals the magic of the wild in our daily lives, and it has taken me from fear to wonder. Wild creatures exist outside of our control. They are mostly innocuous and rarely dangerous. Those who know them understand that wild animals require acceptance for what they are, as Sina writes, not enslavement for what we want them to be. The most poignant point of the book is that perspectives of heart, sky, earth, water, are explored together. We come across 15 iconic Indian species that require compassion and care. Neha Sena examines these creatures' needs as well as their agency and decision-making processes. Wild and Willful is an important contribution to the contemporary nature writing. The book is valuable because it emphasizes the significance of interactions between human and non-human creatures. It is impossible to overstate how important interactions are to transformation. Wild and Willful examines topics like violence, habitat destruction, gender bias, animal right advocacy, and more to reveal the wider picture of the wildlife conservation in India. While we may think that animals are the intruders to the habitats occupied by us, Sina has pointed out that it is the other way around by writing the book from the perspective of the animals and how in their lives we are the intruders to their lands. There are profound messages interlayered in the stories to emphasize the importance of animals while adding depth and meaning to the issue as a whole. If you're an avid reader of the nature genre, this book is a must-have for your collection. Readers who aren't experts but are eager to learn and unlearn may take up this book, read one chapter a day, enjoy the poetry prose, see the butterflies float, and realize the massive issues our species face every minute. Thank you.
Thank you. Next up, we have Aditi Joshi from Vidya Sagar. A person might be surrounded by people, but at the end, it's the nature who has the capacity, the capability to pull out the grief out of someone. A very good morning to respected dignitaries and one and all listening to me. I, Aditi Joshi from Vidya Sagar, is here to present a really great book, in my opinion, Savi and the Memory Keeper. The book is written by Madam Bijal Vichajnani. She is, she is an esteemed author, a great journalist, and an activist who have been working to raise awareness about climate change and environment. The book deftly weaves upon coping up with grief, the urgent need for climate action, teenage friendships, the desire to fit in, and how a tree hug can cure a person. Savi was really close to her father, and her family was united in very many ways, and she was happy. Yet, it all changed drastically after her father's demise. Yes, it's really sad to hear that. The city where they shifted complemented her father's plans. Savi had a really desperate desire to keep her father's plans alive forever with her. So she started communicating with those plans. And ultimately, this helped her to cope up with the grief. Savi, her mother, and her sister dealt with the grief in their own unique ways. The book brings light to the healing power of nature. As I said at the beginning, a person might be surrounded by people, but at the end, it's the nature, it's the individuality of a person who can pull the grief out of him. So a person who wants to know how nature is important, how that individuality is important, must read the book. Thank you, and have a great day ahead. Now we have Samya Soni from DPS Rao. Rao. Have you ever wondered what happened to the butterfly you saw in your garden? What happened to that bird on the television? What happened when you saw a leopard in the wildlife? Have you ever wondered for once, where are they now? What are they doing? What about the Indian leopards? What is India doing? To know that, there is a beautiful book written by Neha Sinha, Wild and Willful, which talks about 15 iconic Indian species. It has four elements, earth, sky, and water, connecting to the fourth, the heart, which is the most important one. We all need an emotional touch in our lives, just like these animals who are waiting for our love and our support. We need to provide them with the conservation to know that, refer to the book, Wild and Willful. And how can we control the species who are made before us? How are we supposed to? Can you do that? What do you think about elephants who are killed on that rollway? And this book is pure facts and not just beating around the bush. And as we are a social animals, we need to understand the agony and the pain the animals go through. I highly recommend this book for all of you present here to read. This book will take you on a wonderful ride from fear to willful. And this will tell you the stories of the citizens of India, which are the more wildest and the willful. Thank you. Katie from the Daily College. Not boring. It's wacky. It's creative. It's almost magical when you get successful after years of hard work. Good morning to all the bookworms sitting in the audience and to all the respected teachers. I'm Nia Bahiti from Daily College. They made one and they found one. A book by Shweta Taneja is a must-have in your personal library. Initially, when I heard about this book and found out that it's about inventions and discoveries, to be honest, I wasn't interested in myself. As when you hear about inventions and discoveries, you have this feeling that there's scientific jargon, and most of the time, it's beyond the comprehension of most of the people. But the moment I read the first few pages, I was like, oh my god, 
It was quite interesting. And before I even knew, I was engrossed in reading. And I got so gripped in these stories. There are stories of 20 passionate, daring scientists who set about the desire to do something. Be it inventing a plasma separator, or Vijaya Lakshmi, who can't get enough of looking into the human brain. There are also celebrity scientists like Sonam Wakchu, who made the biggest artificial uh, glacier in the world that could solve climate emergency. Third story is about making rainforests. And who knew that you could make a rainforest? There are crazy, fantastic stories, and each chapter has boxes full of extra stories. There are detective adventures, then there are activities, and then there are hilarious asides by somebody called Patty, who is crazy about wealth, rats, and is obsessed about them. There are even empty pages in this book, where you can write what you think, what you feel about science, write your ideas, write what you're curious about, or maybe write your own story. If you really want to know what goes on in the minds of scientists and in the lab behind the scenes, I highly suggest you to take up this book, as it takes you out of the book's theoretical science and into what really happens with the scientists in India. And now, you might ask about the cost, and you might feel that, is it really worth it? You get two books in the cost of one, with half being about discoveries and half being about inventions. And that makes my point very clear, that the first thing you should do is buy this book. It is the best book in this world, and don't be late, because otherwise it might be out of stock, for, because this book is going to be the next bestseller. I could not stop reading this book, and once I started reading it, I almost finished it in literally just a few hours. And I highly suggest you to read this book. I bet you that it will make you fall in love with science. And what, and who knows, your interest in science develops to such a level where a book is written about you. Thank you. Happy reading. Next up, we have Tanishq Motwani from Delhi College. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even notice you all. I was just so engrossed in reading this book. But it's not my fault. It's just so interesting. Let me tell about you. First, Jiro, an innocent boy, was just hunting at the beach when he saw a monstrosity. A fish called Bowl, which keeps getting larger in size. At first, he thought that it was fine and he was just hallucinating from hunger. But was he? Before he knew it, the fish devoured him. Oh, the horror! What about poor Jiro? But on another note, isn't this intriguing? Wouldn't you like to read on further? I'm sure you would. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, that's what happens when you read about stories from different cultures. Shockingly, research has shown that 39.7% of all Andamanese tribes have stopped practicing their own cultures. And what about their rich heritage and rich heritage and literatures? Will they be just lost in the pages of history? We can't let this happen. We, as the citizens of this country, can't let another major part of our rich heritage just disappear from this world like this. No, we can't. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just so engrossed about telling you about this book that I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Tanish Motwani from Daily College, and today I'm going to break the amazing news to you that Mrs. Anvita Abhi has just released her new book, Voices of the Lost Horizon, the stories and songs of the great Andamanis. And it is out for sale at just a throwaway price in today's time. And why you should? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You must buy this book. Firstly, this book not only exposes you to the Andamanese culture, songs and poems, but it paints a picture. You start reading it, and suddenly, you're, you find yourself in the magical islands of the Andaman, listening to the cultural songs, and also hearing the folksy tales over there. But one thing which it does is that it helps in the intermixing of other cultures. Because when you learn the values and also the lessons from tales like Deacon Conmo and De the Demon and the Fish. You're able to in incorporate them in your day-to-day -day lives. Oh my God, I'm sorry. I've just 
spoken too much about it. If I tell you anything more about the book, it will be a huge spoiler. So you will have to read it yourself. And secondly, ladies and gentlemen, with a show of hands, how many of you are not extroverts and enjoy spending your time indoors with friends and families rather than socializing? Please raise your hands. Perfect. This book really is for you. Because while reading this book, you'll be able to indulge in so many different cultures and their songs and stories without having to leave the room. You'll also be able to learn about so many cultures in one go. The book will also encourage you to visit the world outside. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, we all have our mother tongues, right? And how would we feel? when we get to know that these languages will not be spoken at all in the recent years, that they will just vanish from this world and like they never existed, we would be heartbroken, wouldn't we? Yes, so it is important for us to preserve these cultures and reading this book and understanding these cultures is really a good start. So to conclude, I would like to quote Boa Senior, don't let the language slip away. Keep a hold on it. Thank you. With this, we come to the end of the uh, Bookshark event. I would now like to request our esteemed chief guest, guest of honor, authors, teacher escorts, and participants to move to the foyer for tea which, and hats, of re hats off to reading. Hats off to reading is a fun event in which participants will wear hats of different shapes and sizes during the tea break. The hats carry famous quotations or phrases from acclaimed works of literature. Also, one more note, all daily college students to move to the dining hall for tea. Thank you.